Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, this is a wonderful time. It's so good to see all of y'all. So this officially kicks off 2017 Solar Second Street Festival. So give, 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 give yourself a hand. Give yourself a hand. Right now, we're going to ask Pastor Wade Jenkins to come and give us an invitation, please. All hearts and minds are stayed on Christ. I want to offer today a prayer uh, for God's people, which is to be on one accord. And this is for the unity of God's people. Oh God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our only Savior, the Prince of Peace, give us grace seriously to lay to the heart the great dangers we are in by our unhappy division. Take away whatsoever may hinder us from union and concord, that as there is but one body and one spirit and one hope of our calling. O oh Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of us all. So we may all of one heart and of one soul, united in one holy bond of truth and peace, of faith and charity, and may with one mind and one mouth that we might glorify God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And everyone said amen. Amen. I'm so glad everybody got a chance to come out. We're so excited about this weekend. Um, from all the organizations that have worked so hard the last year, um, Danville County, African American Historical Society, Danville Public Library. But for humanities, I always get that wrong, but there's a lot of people that have just worked hard, and, you know, has supported us. Now we're on, in our third year of the festival, and we got a lot of things happening. I know everybody will be excited about tomorrow, which is the naming of the renaming of Danville Bay Middle School to John W. Bay Middle School. That's 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 a wonderful thing. So we're gonna we're gonna get started. We're not gonna yeah. Get things, get things. So glad. That Excited, you know, um, we're not going to carry it on. So the first thing, the first gentleman that we're going to bring up, he, he works here at the library. He's, he's been, he studied the Boy Scouts, he's been part of the Boy Scouts, and the Boy Scouts for many years. So at this time, we're going to bring up Mr. Bill Ellis, that he just get started. Yeah. Steve, I'm sorry. It's all right. I answered anything but late for dinner. <laughs> like I said, of course, I am Steve Ellis. And I do a little thing that I call Boy Scout Genealogy. Uh, I come by this quite naturally, as I've been a member of the Boy Scouts of America now for over 50 years. I've been a volunteer leader for over 43 years, and that's just a few months shorter than I have been as an Eagle Scout. And I did my scouting in Southern California. <laughs> and when our family moved here in 1986, I promised my wife I would do less scouting. I took on the role of the district commissioner, and that meant that I would travel to different troops in the district there in which Danville and Boyle County were in to see that they had, the boys were having a good time, the leaders had what they needed and such. And I discovered that Danville was really pretty unique in the scouting that I had grown up in. It was unique because in Danville today, a young man can experience the kind of scouting that his father or his grandfather or even his great-grandfather did. That's because we live largely still in a rural area. But that's also because a lot of the old men that were running the units had been here as boys themselves. And as I said, the troops were pretty well run, which meant I got to drink coffee and listen to a lot of stories. And I started to gather information on this because these old guys were beginning to pass away, and I felt that their work had value and that the stuff they had done had merit. And I wanted to 
I wanted to fill in a lot of gaps. In order to fill in the gaps, I had to know who was who and what was what. So I began to do all these different things. And I, I gathered my sources by primary sources, by people who were in the units or people who had run the units. I look at uh, troop stuff. Boy Scout troops don't throw away anything. Anything. And even the least little thing is important. And then I look in the city newspaper, which the Danville papers were quite quite uh, in-depth on scouting. Uh, but they were unique in that the units in Danville had a history of gathering together for their courts of honor. We haven't done this in 60 years now. Every troop has its little courts of honor. But back in the day, all the troops used to gather. Uh, the troops from the 2nd Street area would gather at, at Bates School and hand out their awards. And, oh yes, let's get this going. It, uh, it was in the newspaper. So-and-so earned his second class badge. So-and-so earned his part one of Scoutmaster certification. And uh, there was a standing board of review for any boy in the city. Didn't matter which troop he belonged to. You could go once a month to the high school or Dabble, and they would review your record, and if you were worthy, they would advance you. And then there was a little thing that was called the Walla Kazoo. So they got together and uh, had contests against each other and demonstrated their skills. That was Danville. And Danville came to scout, or scouting came to Danville on December 7th, 1911. We know this from a front page uh, article on the Advocate Messenger, which it was stated that Nelson Rhodes and a group of religious leaders from different churches met at the courthouse and they organized two troops. That was pretty nifty. Troop 1 and Troop 2. That Troop 1 still continues today as Troop 326 out of the Christian Church. It's one of the few units in Central Kentucky that is that old. Troop 2 today still continues. That's the one at the uh, Centenary Methodist Church. And it's known as Troop 27. By 1928, the scouting program had grown. And little councils, Danville had its own little council called the Isaac Shelby Area Council. Uh, it was merged with Winchester and Lexington to form the Bluegrass Council. It was a way for scouting to be more efficient. These were called service centers because they keep the records and stuff. Still haven't got Second Street, Because scouting didn't come to Second Street until June 7, 1932. 21 years after scouting came to Danville. And that was a, that was a big deal. Uh, when it came, because now the entire city was involved in scouting. Two troops, 30 boys each, total 60 boys. Let me, let me set the stage why it took 21 years to come. Boy Scouts of America began on February 8, 1910. Uh, William Boyce, the gentleman who organized it, was granted a charter for Congress. He owns the work of Boy Scouting, and it was under that that they organized everything. You want to call yourself a Boy Scout? Then you got to play by our rules. And, and it, it worked. The, uh, the first African-American scout troop was set up in North Carolina, in Elizabeth City, on uh, July 31st, 1911. I understand it still continues today. I haven't been able to find out. I tried to, tried to verify because troops have a way of merging numbers and such. But I understand it still continues today. That was organized at a national level. Boy Scouts of America instituted what they called the uh, Interracial Relationships Committee. And they sent people out across the country to organize troops specifically for boys who would be excluded. The first locally organized <coughs> in America on a local level was in Lowell. And that was Troop 75. At the Church of Our Merciful Savior there. Louisville took one step extra when other councils didn't. They set up a complete council within a council. And in less than 10 years, they had over 5,000 boys and young men and over 248 troops <coughs> playing this game. Boy Scouts also set up what they called rail scouting. The railroads had contacted Boy Scouts to see if there could be something that could be done to eliminate the vandalism that was along rail lines. 
County saw this as an opportunity. They, they gladly put men on trains and would stop in rural towns and set up scout troops. But they aggressively went into minority areas and they were looking for kids that would have never ever had a chance to play the game of scouting. And they were hugely successful. By 1932, when the two troops were formed here on 2nd Street, the southeast region of which Kentucky was part of was the largest region in the country and 60% of it was African American. And that's only part of the story because there was a lot of groups that did not want these boys as leaders. And they actively pursued the BSA to get after a policy of exclusion. And when the BSA refused to officially ban them, these groups took matters in their own hands and began to go out and raid troop meetings, campouts, and other events. It was dangerous to be a scout back then. It was dangerous to be a social back then. And still, People signed up, and people played the game. Uh, the BSA did keep records based on race until 1954. At that time, they quit keeping records, and they just said, you know what, it's not worth it. It took another 20 years before they said, that's it, no more segregation. There was one council left in America, and boom, it was done, officially. There was, uh, I was approached a few years ago by somebody that's here that said they'd never made their Eagle Scout because they couldn't get enough time to earn swimming and life-saving merit badges. Back in those days, to be an Eagle Scout, you had to have swimming and life-saving. And he said he just could not get <coughs> the time in the pools. You know, as a scout growing up and working on my life badge in 1973 and trying to get done before 1974 because they changed scouting then. No longer was swimming and life-saving the requirement that it was. Well, it's still there. The rule reads today that you can earn life-saving merit badge or emergency career badges. And you can earn swimming or you can earn hiking or cycling. No more would there be anything that would exclude a kid like it had in the past. It took a long time. It took, what, 64 years to come to this? And that's a rule that's still in place today. And I'm an Eagle Scout that didn't earn his swimming and life-saving merit badge. I have become a better swimmer. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Back early, about 1916, Dan Beard, who was one of the founders of Boy Scouts of America, he is the American component. And Boy Scouts of America was founded by three men. Lord Baden Powell, the English fellow who dreamed up all this nonsense. Uh, Ernest Thompson Seaton, the naturalist, who had a little thing called the uh, Woodcraft Rangers. And Uncle Dan Beard, who was born in Birdside, Kentucky, down the road, was an illustrator who lived up in Covington. He had a group called the Sons of Daniel Boone. He was asked by the national office how many African Americans he had registered in his group there in Ohio. And his reply to the national office was, I'm not really sure, they're all scouts. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Everything seemed to come later. Uh, where the first Eagle Scout in America was Arthur Eldred of Oceanside, New York. And he earned his award on August 21, 1912. The first African American to earn the Eagle Scout Award was Edgar Cunningham Sr. of Waterloo, Iowa. And he earned his award on June 8, 1926. There's a, BSA hasn't kept records like that. But there's been a growing movement, especially among Eagle Scouts, to see that this kind of a record is noted. Finally, we get the 2nd Street. June 7, two troops were chartered. Uh, Stanley Harris of the Interracial Committee out of New York City was the one that came down and organized these two troops. He was invited to Danville. And I have an idea who might have invited him. Uh, I don't want to say until I get it nailed down, but that's... <laughs> He didn't just show up here out of the blue. And the numbers they had, Troop 153 and Troop 154, those numbers come from a national database. See, the troops in Danville there was 25, 26, 27, and then you had Troop 153 and 154. I know. If you're not a Boy Scout, it probably doesn't matter to you. <laughs> you know, to a Boy Scout, you kind of know. And I know at this day and age in the Bluegrass Council, if I see a kid run around with a number 2222, two, two, he's probably an LDS unit. 
So 153 and 154, I just got that confirmed last night. But uh, they had a big presentation over at Bates School. The Scoutmaster of Troop 153 was George Parr with William Goodwin as his assistant scoutmaster. Dr. T.W. Roach as Troop Committee Chairman, Professor J.W. Bate, Ashby Jackson, and Reverend B.W. Spillman as the Troop Committee. You know, let me say something about being a scoutmaster. Back in the 30s, you actually signed a piece of paper that said you would not smoke, <laughs> drink, curse, or tell rude jokes. <laughs> oh boy. We don't do that anymore, but I wonder if we need to. <laughs> I know, we're talking about it now, but that was, that was the rule, and they took it very seriously. If you look at that picture, did this move at all? Not at all. Mary, you're going to have to. Can you? you talk, I'll, I'll, I'll. Okay. As you can see, look at those guys. They don't look, I was talking with Miss Prince there beforehand, they don't look like they pull a bunch of monkey business and fool around a lot. Uh, but they all have something in common just before you click it. Do you notice one thing that's common to those three pictures? And I don't mean the fact that they're all scouts. And I haven't done much work on Girl Scouting and Cub Scouting only because I keep tripping over stuff with Boy Scouts and I'm trying to do it before the old timers are gone. They all have that same look in their eye. They're all working on, uh, on the scout law and the scout oath. They're all working on being better people. They're all working on getting ahead. Uh, let's see, Scoutmaster of Troop 154 was Joseph H. Sinkler, with Franklin John Fisher as his assistant scoutmaster. Professor W.C. Simmons was Troop Committee Chairman, and Levi Terrence and Lawrence Mullins as Troop Committee members. These two troops would last roughly until about 1948, and then they kind of disappear. And that's the nature of scout troops. They're kind of like uh, they're kind of like flowers. They grow and they blossom and then they fade out and then they come back. It's like in one, uh, 1954, Troop 154 is reorganized. Let me ask you, anybody here from Troop 154 in that time period? Back in the day. Back in the day. <laughs> Who we got over here? Glenn Ball. Glenn Ball. Yeah. i got to add your name to my record. <laughs> I know, Charles Ford, you were part of the Cub Scout pack, weren't you? Me? No, Mr. No. Ford. I'm not Ford, I'm Gray. Gray. Pardon my friend. <laughs> uh, what's notable is back in uh, 1954, when they got reorganized, Troop 154, Matt Fisher, Matthew Fisher, was a scoutmaster. Now, that's... That's a scout stepping up to be a scout master. Uh -huh. Before I get too far, let me go into what it is to earn an Eagle Scout, which is what every scout strives to be. To be an Eagle Scout, you have to actually fill out an application. It's an award. You don't just do some badges and give you a medal. It can take years to gain. There are but six requirements. The first is to garner those 21 Blessed Merit Badges, of which 13 are required. A young man gets a real good rounded education. The rest are up to him. There's a 34 different, 134 different subjects to go through. The earning of these merit badges allows a young man to learn how to teach himself on any subject. Because to earn a merit badge, what you do is you get the little book, you read the requirements, and you do what it says. If it says build it, you build it. Go there, you go there, write it, you write it, tell it, you tell it. When you get it all done, you find a counselor who knows these things, and you present your stuff to them. And if you're good, if you've done everything correctly, you earn the badge. If you haven't, then he'll counsel you and, and bring you up to speed. Or he may ask you to come back. Now you do this 21 times. You do this 21 times and pretty soon you have the ability to look at any subject, strip down the fluff and get down to the kernel of everything. Next, you've got to run around town and gather at least three, but no more than six letters of recommendation. People who say you're living your life to your scout oath and scout law, and these letters are sealed. So you better be good. Okay? You must serve your fellow scouts in a leadership position for no less than six months. Then there's the blessed project. 
Back when they first started this, there was no project. By the late 40s, it was due a project of service to your community. By the early 60s, it was find a service project of value to your community and tell your scoutmaster. By the time I did it, I had to write a report. And nowadays, these little guys fill out a 32-page booklet <coughs> finders. I have kids coming to me with plats and surveys and all kinds of stuff. I swear they're getting ready to go up in front of planning and zoning. <laughs> <laughs> there is. These kids really sweat it out. And then when you get down to the end, yeah, we'll talk with your scoutmaster. When you get down to the end, you have to write your life's purpose. You're asked as a young man to look ahead. What has earning the Eagle Scout Award done for you? And what do you think you're going to do in your life? And you get all kinds of things. You get some kids that are very specific, and you get some other kids that are just like, you know, I don't know. I just know I did this, and I feel like I can do more. In putting together all this, because I gather all this information, I put it in a little database, and then I, I get excited, and I tell Mary Gerard, and she said, you need to tell people about this. How do I talk to a room full of people who aren't involved in scouting? I ran into a fellow named Kurt Bannis, who, as a student at Wake Forest University taking a class on the New South, wrote a thesis about scouting that really hit the nail on the head. And I spent two days chasing down Mr. Bannis. Uh, I found him on the African American Registry, and they didn't know where he was. They just used his stuff, and they had contact information. He graduated in 2004. And this is what he had to say near the end. Through scouting, black young people finally had something to be proud of, something that would make them, at least in one realm, equal or even superior to white children. It gave them a sense of identity that was lacking for centuries. It was no longer just boy, they were an Eagle Scout. Before desegregation and nearly all white Eagle Scout applications, the essay included references to leadership opportunities that came out of their award. Leadership is mentioned much less often among black applicants having not seen the same opportunities for leadership in their communities as they progressed through the scouts. Another theme among the pre-civil rights applications was frequent mentioning of God and church in the white applications compared to the black applications. The white applications tended to connect God and country together as an important trait of an Eagle Scout, as for example, the Eagle Award would show me that I've been doing my duty to God and my country as a scout. Black Scouts did not mention citizenship nearly as often, and when they did, it was usually in a secular manner. I am an American on whom the future of this wonderful country depends, learning to be of service to others. This distinction is the result of a lack of citizenship experienced from the beginning of this country. It is telling that an organization like the Boy Scouts of America, dedicated from its inception to raising men of high moral strength and conviction, supported racism. But at the same time, on a national and local level, the Scouts did have certain leaders that pressed against the grain of society for racial change. In the end, though, our most valuable insight is into the minds of these young men who wrote of an equal chance for distinction and success in their Eagle Award essays. This relatively small achievement may have helped and inspired them to push on in a fight for liberty. As I said, I had mentioned a few names before of these men that stepped forward, at least in 1932. Uh, Dr. T.W. Roach, he died when he was 35. He was a dentist. His son, Sanford Chuck, Chick. 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 He was a head coach at Dunbar mm -hmm. in Lexington in 1950. <clears throat> Ashby Jackson was 70 plus when he died in 1948. Uh, contractor, mortician. It says here he had no children. I don't know about that. He was also a member of the Elks Odd Fellows, something called the UBT and Masons. Matthew Fisher was 59 when he died. Uh, first president of the NAACP here in Danville. John Franklin Fisher, teacher and coach at Bates School. His, his, uh, his boy attended the Yale Medical School, and he was part of the BGA League champion team in 1931. William Goodman, Director of Public Relations at KSU, former teacher at Bate High School and coach, a referee. You don't mess with referees, do you? <laughs> Joe Sinkler, died in a car crash in 1948. 
on his birthday, two months after his wife's long okay. illness. He was First Baptist Church Sunday School Superintendent, City Councilman, painter and paper hanger. It too said he had no children. George Parr, he died as an old man. Head janitor of the post office, active in choir of Presbyterian Church and Community Chest, died in 1971. They had him listed as a World War I veteran. I can find no other listing of that. And Lawrence Mullins, all I got from Lawrence Mullins was he was a playground director in 1935. And I'm not sure if he was a student in 1949 at UK or not. I run into a couple of different Lawrence Mullins. James Harrigan died in 1971, uh, Doric Lodge, and I have a Carl Boffman as a private first class. This would have been World War II. Let me read some other names here. Julian Fisher, William Faulkner, Harry Whitley, William Billy Tucker, Kenneth Prince, Carlos Rice, Roy Neal Jr., Howard William Howard Rice, Walter Trumbo, James Richard Jones, Charles Ford, Billy Joe Johnson, James Munford, Ronnie McCown, Donald Lee Faulkner, George D. Fields, Horace Ball, Gary Ford, Billy Brown, Wallace Hines, Ben Jenkins, Eliza Gray, William McGee, James L. Anderson, Jr., and Thomas Lewis. Now, the two troops were gone by the time I got here in 1986. It would be nice to get them going again, but who knows. We do have at least three African-American Eagle Scouts in town. Uh, Marvin Swan in 1971. Jim Shannon in 1973. And Steve Davis over at Troop 326 was telling me about a young man named Eric Coulter. Yeah. I, I couldn't get there. I think that was about 1979. So we were, we were discussing this the other night, and he said, Mr. May saw Mr. Calder on the street there as a kid and says, you need to be in our scout troop. And that's the way Mr. May ran. So that's kind of the long and short now of, of scouting on 2nd Street. There will be more. I bump into people, and they tell me more all the time. So I just the information I got today was on the uniforms yesterday. There was one other uh, black troop, which is Troop 103 from St. James Amy Church in, in the 60s. In the 60s, St. James? And, and I do have the uh, charter at, 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 at home. And the, uh, uh, the charter was, was Port Smith and um, uh, Mr. Albany Taylor. Names on there as the uh, leaders. All right, I'd love to flesh that out. I'm, what I'm chasing down now is that Cub Scout picture you saw in several of the articles there seemed to be a little bit of a war on Cub Scouting here in town. The, the Cub Scout troop you saw build itself as the oldest in the, in the city. Okay? And uh, you know what, I'm, I'm really wanting to prove that because Cub Scouting came, uh, Cub Scouting was approved at the time these two troops started. So it's entirely possible that 2nd Street had the oldest Cub Scout pack in town. And that's what I'm looking for. Well, see me. Tell me your stories. Give yes. me names. See you, and then see me. I'd love to scan that document if I could for the record. Okay. And a rebel, yes. uh, C.E. Blake was a pastor being up on St. St. James. We collect everything. There is nothing inconsequential. I'm telling you. And, and on, when he, so he's been doing research on Boy Scouts for as long as I've known him, and we tagged him because anytime I come across something, I'll send it his way. And part of the reason I really wanted him to speak today was so that what he knew could get out, but then other people could please bring in what you know. We really want to we flesh out this history as much as possible. Yeah. Thank you.